Welcome to the Acton Institute and today's Acton Lecture Series event. My name is Stephen Barrows. I'm the Managing Director of Programs here at Acton, where our mission is to promote a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. Today's format will be a lecture of approximately 30 minutes, followed by 30 minutes of questions and answers. We are recording this event, so those who want to ask a question should raise their hand and wait for the microphone to be passed to you prior to asking your question. One of the most important dimensions of individual liberty is religious liberty, a freedom which captures both dimensions of Acton's mission. And so today, I'm delighted to introduce a great defender of religious liberty, John Birch. John Birch is Senior Counsel and Vice President of Appellate Advocacy with Alliance Defending Freedom. He has argued 12 Supreme Court cases, U.S. Supreme Court cases, and more than 30 state Supreme Court cases since 2011. Among all frequent Supreme Court advocates who did not work for the federal government, one study concluded that Birch had the third highest success rate for persuading justices to adopt his legal position. In addition to being one of only seven Michigan lawyers inducted into the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers, the Best Lawyers peer-reviewed listings has recognized John twice as a Lawyer of the Year for Appellate Practice and once for Bet the Company litigation. Birch served as Solicitor General for the State of Michigan from 2011 to 2013. As part of his private firm, Birch Law, he has represented Fortune 500 companies, including Dow Chemical, Tesla, and Whirlpool, numerous state governments, top public officials, and industry associations in high-profile cases. Among his cases include six, which had at least $1 billion or more at stake. So please join me in welcoming John Birch. Well, thank you all for being here. It's great to be able to do these in person again um, and, and not to be presenting on Zoom. I want you to think hard as I'm talking about the questions you want to ask because as a Supreme Court advocate, I'm used to giving answers in 15 to 20 second sound bites and then immediately getting asked another question. Um, so it's going to be a, a difficult effort to just get through 30 minutes uninterrupted. But once we get to that point, we can have some fun. Uh, we like to think about the United States as one of the most protective countries in the world uh, when it comes to religious liberty, and that certainly could be true, but that doesn't mean that we have not had our fair share of up and downs. Uh, when the Puritans first left uh, England for the colonies to escape the restrictions of the Church of England, they promptly established their own state religion for the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and they banned all religious dissenters. Uh, after the United States was founded, the states of Delaware, Georgia, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, North and South Carolina, and Vermont all required office holders to be Christian and Protestant. Pennsylvania barred atheists from public office, and Jewish uh, residents of Rhode Island could practice their religion freely, but they were prevented from being citizens, and so they also could not hold office or even vote. So when we examine the religious liberty landscape in the United States today, it's important to understand um, that there have been tumultuous times when religious liberty was not respected in the past. Um, that said, we've certainly seen a significant uptick in religious liberty violations over the last two decades. Uh, the federal government is pushing in initiatives that would require doctors and hospitals to violate their religious beliefs in the context of abortion and gender transition surgeries. Uh, California last year nearly passed legislation that would prohibit religious colleges and universities from using religion as a criteria to hire their faculty. Uh, numerous states, including Michigan, have used so-called Blaine Amendments to prevent religious schools from accessing state funding that is available to all non-religious schools. Government officials are using public accommodation laws to force creative professionals, you know, think videographers, florists, cake makers, calligraphers, um, to engage in speech and participate in ceremonies that violate their religious beliefs. Courts routinely, uh, routinely allow dissenters to just drive by crosses or Ten Commandments that happen to be sitting on public property and claim that they're offended and then demand that those be torn down. And it goes on and on. Um, right here in Michigan, our state attorney general right now is trying to prevent religious foster care and adoption agencies from having state licenses because of their religious beliefs on marriage, notwithstanding a Michigan law that the legislature enacted and the, the governor signed specifically to protect their religious liberty rights. 
Uh, the city of East Lansing is attempting to bar a family farm from the city's farmer's market solely because the farm's owner posted his Catholic beliefs about marriage on Facebook. And there's litigation pending in the Michigan courts uh, seeking to reinterpret our state civil rights act to punish a professional who declined to participate in a gender transition procedure that violated her religious rights. So the, the crux of all these infringements, both in Michigan and around the country, is a misunderstanding of what religious liberty is. Uh, public officials rarely try to stop the practice of religion in mosques or church or synagogues, although we saw kind of a, a startling um, counterexample of that with COVID, where the government was actually shutting down places of worship at the same time it was allowing marijuana shops and strip clubs and casinos to operate. Um, you know, but those are really the exception. Uh, but the thing is, the U.S. Constitution doesn't protect the practice of religion. It protects the free exercise of religion. And Justice Gorsuch on the Supreme Court explained in a recent opinion uh, what that means. The free exercise clause protects not just the right to be a religious person or merely the freedom to practice religion in a place of worship. It also or, uh, protects the right to act on those beliefs outwardly and publicly. In other words, to live your religious beliefs in the public square. Uh, now, as the, the program summary noted, since 2011, religious liberty litigants have won 18 out of 19 cases at the U.S. Supreme Court. And some would say, well, that's because the Supreme Court has a conservative majority and it's been packed by conservative presidents. But that ignores that 14 of those 18 wins were unanimous or by supermajority margins. Um, so it's not simply a matter of, of politics. Um, and that includes last year's decision in Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, uh, where the court ruled unanimously to protect the rights of Catholic social services in Philadelphia, which had had its foster care license revoked by the city because of its religious beliefs about marriage. Um, so we, we look at those numbers, 18 out of 19, does that mean that religious liberty is secure? Um, and the answer to that, unfortunately, is no. Um, to begin, those 18 decisions were extremely narrow victories, um, sometimes you know, incrementally moving the law in, in one direction, and perhaps intentionally so to garner those supermajorities and those, un those unanimous votes. Uh, but more concerning is that those cases even got to the Supreme Court because what they mean is that lower courts upheld the government's ability to discriminate against religious organizations in government funding, forced religious nuns to include abortifacients in their employee health plans against their deeply held religious beliefs, ordered a local government to tear down one of those veterans memorial crosses which had been in place for more than 70 years and was funded entirely by private donations that were raised by veterans and even gave a green light to a COVID order in New York that forced a 1,000 plus seat cathedral to have no more than 10 people attending for a worship service. You know, and, and so we're gonna continue to see cases at the Supreme Court as long as we continue to see violations like that happening as well as courts that are willing to uphold them. Um, so I, I look at the fact that some of these cases had to go all the way to the Supreme Court as the, the canary in the coal mine. Um, so the important question in all of this is, where is the free exercise clause? Why is it that so many people, in the lower courts at least, um, and, and sometimes without any judicial intervention at all, are seeing their religious liberty rights impinged? And, and a big part of that problem is because the U.S. Supreme Court itself neutralized the free exercise clause in its 1990 decision in Employment Division versus Smith. Uh, so what I'm going to do with my, my brief uninterrupted marks is kind of give you a primer about Smith that won't take long, and then ways that the U.S. Supreme Court has um, basically taken little doctrines to take bites out of that case to where we are today. And then I'm going to address some of the cases that are on the court's docket right now or that could be in the near future, maybe prognosticate a little bit uh, about what I think the court is going to do with those, and then conclude with some general thoughts about where we're headed with respect to our religious liberty. Then lots of questions, I hope. Um, so Smith was a 1990 decision. In the decades prior to that, the controlling case in the US Supreme Court involving religious liberty rights was Sherbert versus Verner, uh, which was a case involving a Seventh-day Adventist who was fired after declining to work on the Sabbath and then denied state unemployment benefits. 
And in looking at the state's denial of state unemployment benefits based on this religious belief, the court applied what's called strict scrutiny. And for the, the non-lawyers in the room, strict scrutiny is the highest standard that we have under law for examining a government regulation. In order for a regulation where strict scrutiny applies to survive, the government has to prove it has a compelling government interest, and those are hard to come by, and that the, the solution that they took to advance that interest is the narrowest one possible. So this was the maximum amount of protection for religious liberty. Um, and in the, the, the Sherbert case, the court said that the state's decision was unconstitutional because the government failed to satisfy that high standard. So you fast forward a couple of decades, and we get to Smith in 1990. Um, and, and this was one of Justice Scalia's few mistakes uh, on the court. He actually authored the opinion. Um, and ironically and enough, it involved unemployment benefits all over again. Um, it was in the state of Oregon, and there were two individuals who had used peyote as part of a religious ceremony. Well, that was a banned substance in Oregon. So when they were fired by their employer and they filed for unemployment benefits, the state said, well, no, because we don't give unemployment benefits to people who use illegal drugs. Now, if you had applied Sherbert, then clearly they should have won. But instead, the Supreme Court vacated it and set up a new standard, and it's one that continues to haunt uh, those who are advancing religious liberty today. Uh, what the court said in Smith was that if you have a neutral and generally applicable law that infringes your religious liberty, that's okay. And, and what the, the justices were thinking about were things like illicit drugs or even the speed limit. Um, you know, the, the speed limit is a neutral law. Um, it doesn't favor or disfavor religion. It's generally applicable. Everybody has to follow it. And as a society, we'd be in trouble if people could claim religious exemptions to the speed limit. But at the same time, what, what the decision failed to recognize is that there are other circumstances where this rule is absolutely absurd. So, you know, say hypothetically that Ottawa County decided to be a, a dry county, um, and, and so no alcohol was allowed to be sold or consumed anywhere in the county. And that would include religious services on Sunday being unable to use wine in their sacramental services, you know, whether it was mass or, or another service. Um, there is not a single person at the time of the drafting and the ratification of the First Amendment and the Free Exercise Clause who would have thought that the government would have the ability to stop Catholics from having wine as part of their Eucharistic celebration. And yet that's the natural result of the Smith case. You know, something is, is wrong with that. And so in the decades since Smith in 1990, um, both politically and through the courts, we've looked for ways to soften that ruling and protect religious liberty. Now, the immediate response to it came from Congress. Um, Congress was appalled by this and, and appalled in a bipartisan way. Um, they enacted a, a law you've probably heard it referred to as RIFRA. It's the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And it was intended to overrule Smith legislatively and reimpose the Sherbert standard. It passed 97 to 3 in the Senate, and President Clinton signed it into law. Now, to, to give you a sense of how much religious liberty has changed since the early 90s to today, um, Senators Chuck Schumer and, and President Joe Biden, who both voted in favor of RIFRA, now call it a license to discriminate, and uh, President Clinton has completely disavowed it. Um, but the Supreme Court neutered even RIFRA by saying that Congress only had the power to impose RIFRA on federal government regulations and not state regulations. And so that means unless a state has its own state RIFRA, the state and local governments in that jurisdiction um, are, are ben you know, benefited by this Smith precedent and they don't have any other restrictions on it. So that's forced the, the Supreme Court more recently to create some workarounds, ways that we can leave Smith in place until they decide to overrule it, but still protect religious liberty. And, and it comes in four flavors. Um, the first exception to Smith that the court has recognized is for religious animus. And this was first articulated in a case called Lakumi, which involved a Florida statute that prohibited animal sacrifice. And there were all kinds of exceptions in Lakumi um, that allowed for animal slaughter so that you could sell um, you know, animals at the grocery store and other things, the only thing that it prohibited was the slaughter that was taking place by a particular religious sect in that area. And given those circumstances, the Supreme Court concluded that this law, this ordinance had been enacted specifically to target 
this particular religion, and that was off limits. It, it was an intent question. And, and then the court applied leukemia more recently in Masterpiece Cake Shop. Uh, that was the, the case a few years ago involving the master baker, Jack Phillips. And Jack was in Colorado. Colorado has one of these public accommodation laws that prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation. And, and Jack does not discriminate against anybody. He will serve all of his customers, but there are certain messages that he can't express. He would never create a custom cake that had swear words on it or cussing of any time. He doesn't make any Halloween cakes apropos of this season because he thinks it favors uh, or supports the occult. And he couldn't make a custom cake that celebrated a marriage that violated his Christian religious beliefs about the meaning of marriage. And the Colorado Civil Rights Commission uh, punished him for that. Uh, it was going to fine him um, and require him and his employees, who were mostly family members, to go through a re-education training process where they could all learn about the way Coloradans should think about marriage. And it gets up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court used this animus principle to rule in favor of Jack Phillips. Uh, on the, the, the board, this Colorado Civil Rights Commission that had punished Jack, one of the board commissioners had compared his Christian religious beliefs about marriage to the Jim Crow South and the Ku Klux Klan and things like that. And other commissioners had kind of nodded their assent to that. No one had disagreed. And the Supreme Court said, based on that expression of animus towards his religion, that was enough to kill the entire case, that the government prosecution against him was invalid. You know, but, but this is one of those examples where you can see by, by ruling in a way that got around Smith, the court ruled so narrowly that it didn't result in any sort of a religious liberty protection for other people in Jack's position. That's why we continue to have cases involving bakers. In fact, Jack himself has been sued two more times um, under these same kind of facts. Um, videographers, florists, you know, et, et cetera, uh, because they didn't say anything broadly about religious liberty protection. So now a litigant would have to prove that there was religious animus. So, so that's category number one. Um, category number two is when the government treats a religious organization or a religious person differently than everybody else simply because they are religious. And this first arose in a case called Trinity Lutheran, which was a school in Missouri. And Trinity Lutheran had a playground where their preschoolers and elementary schoolers played. And there was this great state program that was available to all schools, public and private, where if you resurfaced your playground with those chopped up rubber tires to make a, a softer surface for the kids to be safe, um, that the, the government would, state government, would reimburse the cost of that resurfacing. And so Trinity Lutheran School put in their application. They satisfied all the criteria. When they were ranked, they were near the very top of the list of the schools that were deserving. The state was about to cut the check, and then someone said, well, wait a minute, we've got a Blaine Amendment. Um, Blaine Amendments, um, and, and Michigan has uh, one of a more recent variety, um, are, are mostly a relic of the 1800s when there was a U.S. Senator Blaine who tried to amend the U.S. Constitution to prevent any public dollars flowing to sectarian schools. The idea was he didn't want Catholic schools to ever receive any funding. He failed at the federal level, but 37 states have their own version of Blaine Amendments, which prohibit religious or sectarian schools from having the benefit of any government funding in their education. Um, and, and so Trinity Lutheran ran smack up against this amendment in the Missouri Constitution. And again, the case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, well, the only difference between this school and other private schools is that this one is religious and others are not. You can't use a Blaine Amendment to categorically say all religious organizations are out. I mean, that's unconstitutional because you are treating religious organizations less well than everybody else. Um, but yet in another example of the teeny tiny steps that the court took in these 18 victories, um, it had a footnote which limited the case and its principles to facts involving the resurfacing of school playgrounds. <laughs> Uh, now, of course, this principle will, will come back again, and it does, um, just uh, two years ago in a case called Espinoza. And Espinoza was another school funding case. It arose in Montana. And Montana had created a pool where funds could be do donated and you could get a tax deduction. And then those funds were distributed to low-income families so that they could use them at schools of their choice. They could use it to supplement their education at public schools. They could use it for tuition at private schools, and not only private secular schools, but private religious schools. Well, again, the program is ready to launch, just like in Missouri, and someone in the state revenue department says, well, wait a minute, we've got a Blaine Amendment, and we can't give religious um, schools any money, and that means we can't give families who have students attending religious schools any money. And so they created a rule that the scholarship fund could only be used for public schools, 
private non-religious schools, but religious schools were out. Again, it goes all the way up to the US Supreme Court. This time they, they eliminate the playground resurfacing footnote and they say, okay, Montana's doing exactly what we said you couldn't do in the Trinity Lutheran case. They're treating religious schools and religious families less well than everybody else and you can't do that. Um, and so it, it vacated that decision and opened up the scholarship program for everyone in Montana to participate. Um, we're gonna come back to the, this again because we have another school choice case that's on the docket and gonna be argued December 1st. Um, but I'm gonna put a pin in that for now and move to our third category of workaround. And this is religious institution autonomy. Um, so this has to do with religious organizations that desire to hire people who share their faith in order to transmit it to the, the students or the other people with which they work. Uh, and Hosanna Tabor was the, the first example of this. This was a 9-0 decision. Um, it had uh, the, the newly minted um, Justice Breyer and uh, Justice Kagan. Yes, Kagan on the court, um, and everyone expected them to be hostile to, to religion, and it turns out they were not. They voted in favor, 9-0, um, involving a school which had fired a, a teacher. Now, this school was a Protestant school. It considered all of its teachers ministers, and the Supreme Court recognized that um, that the Constitution had implicit in this promise of religious liberty a ministerial exception. Uh, the, the concept is something like this. If you are a Catholic church and you want to have only males serve as priests, that violates sex discrimination laws at the federal and the state level. But we can't have the government telling the Catholic church who they can hire as priests because priests are ministers and that's essential to what the Catholic church is. Well, the, the court applies that principle in Hosanna Tabor to say the same thing is true of Christian teachers when they're considered ministers. That because their primary responsibility is to pray with the kids, take them to worship service, and inculcate them with the faith, employment laws don't apply to them either. Well, the, this case then comes back again because the court put some limiting language in it in Our Lady of Guadalupe School, which was a California case, again, um, that, that arose two years ago. So the Our Lady of Guadalupe case was a little bit different. Um, it was two different Catholic schools which had also apply, um, fired teachers who wanted to sue under federal and state anti-discrimination laws. Uh, the schools claimed that they were ministers, uh, but unlike the Protestant school in Hosanna Tabor, uh, they did not specifically call these teachers ministers, and they didn't have to have theological training like the Protestant school teacher did in Hosanna Tabor. And the Supreme Court says, well, wait a minute. When we were talking about the ministerial exception, we didn't mean that you had to have a minister title because different religious sects will use titles differently when they're referring to their employees. And we didn't necessarily mean that you had to have theological training, although that would be something that courts could consider. Um, what we want the courts to do is look holistically at the person and decide, is this someone that's important to the organization's passing on of the faith, the transmittal of the faith to others? And clearly, Catholic school teachers, even in the elementary and, and middle school grades, are, are crucial in doing that. Um, you know, without the theology that they're bringing to the students, the school would lose its religious nature altogether. Um, and, and so the, the, church, or the Supreme Court upholds the religious institution autonomy principle again in Our Lady of Guadalupe. Then the final category where the, the Supreme Court has kind of slipped around employment division versus Smith um, is when the government creates broad discretionary exemptions for many people, but won't extend those exemptions to religious believers. Um, and this arose in the first instance in the COVID cases. Um, so pandemic hits, immediately society shuts down, and, and for many months after that, state and local governments are continuing to put restrictions on worship. Uh, the first one of those cases that makes it to the, the US Supreme Court and results in a significant decision is the Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn. And this involved the city of New York's COVID policy. It was a restriction on churches in an area of New York which admittedly had a severe COVID problem. It was the place where the, the outbreak was the worst. But the restrictions were absolutely unbelievable. Um, as I mentioned at, at the outset, this is the, the church, the, the cathedral in New York, that could hold more than 1,000 people. And yet under New York's law, they could have no more than 10 people attending mass. I mean, think about that. In a church of 1,000, only 10 people could attend. At the same time, the city of New York allowed other secular businesses and organizations to have their doors open and have as many people as they wanted so long as they were wearing masks and they abided by social distancing requirements. And the US Supreme Court says, well, wait a minute, this isn't a generally applicable law because you're treating the houses of worship different than everybody else. And 
because they didn't give the religious exemption or give the, the same exemption to the religious organizations as they did for the secular organizations, that was out of bounds. You know, it's kind of this um, different treatment theory, but in an exemption context. And then they expanded on that in a California case called Tandon versus Newsom, Newsom being the governor of California. Uh, so this case was a limit in California on indoor worship, specifically um, in houses and things like that, where they were prohibiting people from gathering in groups of more than 10. But at the same time, you could go rent a skybox at a football game or an arena, and you could have 40 people packed in there as long as they were wearing masks. Um, and the the argument that Gen or Governor Newsom made was that Sure, you know, we, we, we don't disagree with this exemption principle that you're using, but it's not fair to compare a worship service to a skybox or to a grocery store. And, and the U.S. Supreme Court was crystal clear. It, it said, so long that as there are any other groups out there that are receiving exemptions, then the religious entities get them too, even if they're not identically situated. So we're not comparing churches to churches and schools to schools. Um, you know, if, if you can see that the same principles, the same government interest is implicated in having 30 people together in a skybox, then you have to allow at least 30 people to get together at that church. And th this principle, th this broad discretionary exemption rule, kind of reaches its fruition then in the Fulton case. And as I mentioned, Fulton is the case in the city of Philadelphia involving Catholic social services. They get their foster license revoked because of their views on marriage being between one man and one woman. Uh, but they have an exemption in Philadelphia. There is a clause in every single one of these foster contracts that gives the city the discretion to create an exemption to any of its anti-discrimination ordinances. And there's a reason for that. If you had, for example, a predominantly black foster agency that wanted to work with black families and black children, then they would be operating in violation of the anti-racial discrimination principle in that ordinance. And the city of Philadelphia wanted to retain the discretion to allow them to do that. Uh, the Supreme Court says, well, the fact that you left that discretionary governmental power in the contract, even if it has not been exercised, means that you have to extend the exemption to any religious organization that requests it. Um, you know, so now you've, you've got a series of baby steps and a somewhat larger step that protects all um, religious organizations in a governmental context where there is an exemption. But even in Fulton, the court could have gone much, much further. Uh, the Catholic Social Services attorneys had argued that the court should just overrule Employment Division versus Smith and put Sherbert back in place. So essentially, we have a national RIFRA again that would apply to state and local governments whenever we're talking about the Free Exercise Clause. And six justices agreed that as a matter of constitutional law, Smith was illogical and inconsistent with the text and the history of the Free Exercise Clause. Nonetheless, they weren't ready to overrule it. Only three justices were, able, were willing to do that, and, and six said, not yet. And so we continue to take these baby steps. Um, so we, we've got this broad principle then that generally allows the government to infringe on religious liberty, and these four exceptions that started small and have started to get a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. Um, what does the court's docket look like today? Well, there are a couple of important cases that are going to be heard this term. Uh, the very first one is a case called Ramirez. It involves a, a prisoner on death row in Texas, and the oral argument is going to be on November 1st. Now, Texas in the past had prohibited pastors, priests, um, rabbis, others um, from being in an execution chamber at the time that someone was being executed. And the Supreme Court has already said that's unconstitutional. You have to allow someone in the chamber. So in this case, the, the Texas officials in the execution chamber said, well, the, the pastor can come in, but he has to remain silent. He can't speak. He can't read from the Bible. He can't pray out loud. He can't sing. Um, he, he can't lay his hands on, on the inmate, anything like that. And this case is going to decide what the, the religious liberty rights are of the person to be executed with respect to his pastor. Um, hopefully, that's going to be a, a religious liberty right that none of you in this room ever have to confront. <laughs> um, the, the, the next case that they're going to be hearing is on December 1st. Um, and, and it's a shame that it's on December 1st because that's the same day that the U.S. Supreme Court is hearing the Dobbs case, which is the challenge to Mississippi's 15-week law, you know, the biggest abortion case that we've had in more than two decades. And so all the attention is going to be on that. And there's another case being heard that same day, Carson versus Macon, uh, which is just as significant for religious liberty. So now I'm going to take you back briefly um, to that Espinoza case. That was the Montana... Um, scholarship case. 
And the court says you can't discriminate based on someone's religious status. You can't categorically say all religious schools are out. Well, in the meantime, uh, Maine says, well, we still want to prevent public monies from going to religious schools. So we're not going to just say if you're a religious school, you're out. We're going to say that if you're a religious school that actually practices your religion in a serious way, we want you to be out because we don't want any of our public funds to go to worship. So if you're a religious organization or religious school in name only and you're not actually putting it in a practice, then fine, you can have all the government money you want. But if you're actually religious, then you're out. So it's this distinction between religious use and religious status. So in Espinoza, um, Justice Gorsuch, in that very passage that I read to you at the beginning of, of the talk, said that this status use distinction is one that the court is gonna to have to address and resolve in favor of religious liberty because it's ri ridiculous to suggest that someone can be of religious status but not actually put that religious belief into practice in the public square without the government being able to discriminate against you. And so Carson versus Macon is going to decide that question of whether the free exercise clause protects religious use as um, you know, in addition to religious status when it comes to discrimination in government funding. Interestingly, the Federal Court of Appeals that upheld Maine's rule um, had, sitting on its panel and as the author of that opinion, retired Supreme Court Justice David Souter. Um, so some of his former colleagues are going to be reviewing his work. Um, the final case that's on the docket already is a case called Shirtliff. And um, there isn't a, a date set for this oral argument yet, but I would expect it to take place in roughly the February to March time frame. Um, Shirtliff is a religious expression case. It involves the city of Boston and a flagpole that it has in front of City Hall. They actually have three flagpoles. One has the U.S. flag, one has the state flag. The third flagpole usually has the city flag, but they also make it available to anyone who wants to use it. And over the past 10 years, on I think 284 occasions, when different groups or individuals came and wanted to display their flag for the day, they said yes every single time until a Christian group came along and they had a simple Christian cross on their flag and they wanted to fly their flag for one day and the city said no because we think that would be endorsing religion. And predictably the, the lower courts upheld Boston's right to do that, um, which is absolutely insane, not only from a religious liberty perspective but a, from a, a free speech perspective. You can't allow everybody to use a, a forum like that and then say, but religious people aren't invited. It would be like opening up Calder Plaza to any group to gather and have a rally or a protest, but not if you're religious, you know, that, then you're barred. Um, and, and so I expect that's going to be the, the 19th victory out of 20 uh, for religious liberty. Uh, very briefly, here are some of the cases that are waiting in the wings to see if the court is willing to take them. And they're going to implicate a lot of these principles that we're, we've been talking about uh, because the religious liberty litigants in these cases were all victims of the Supreme Court's little bite approach to dealing with Employment Division versus Smith. We've got Seattle's Union uh, Gospel Mission. It's a C Seattle gospel rescue mission that deals with the homeless. Um, and they are explicitly Christian and evangelical in the work that they do. There was an, a, a potential employee who applied for a position as a lawyer in their legal aid clinic and did not agree with all of their religious beliefs and applied with the express purpose of trying to change those beliefs. And the Washington State Supreme Court said unanimously that they have to hire this person, that their desire to have people who share their faith passing on their Christian religious beliefs to the homeless community that they work with um, doesn't give them the ability to hire people based on, on religion. Um, Gordon College is a Christian college in Massachusetts, and they're another one of these ministerial exception cases, just like um, Hosanna Tabor and Our Lady of Guadalupe. The Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, again, says unanimously, well, we see what the Supreme Court did there with elementary and middle school and high school religious teachers, but college professors are different. They're not ministers. <laughs> they, they don't inculcate the faith. They just teach math and, and science and other subjects like that. So the question in Gordon College is whether that ministerial exception should be applied to Christian and other religious colleges. 303 Creative is one of these creative professional cases. It involves a website designer in the state of Colorado, same place as Jack Phillips, so she's dealing with the exact same law. She wants to expand her business into designing wedding websites, but because of her religious beliefs, she can't design websites for same-sex weddings, and she wants to put a, a very beautiful statement on her website explaining her religious beliefs and the messages she can and cannot express. Well, Colorado prohibits all of that. 
Uh, it goes to the Federal Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals said, well, we agree that this is compelling her to speak in a way that violates her religious beliefs. We agree that it's also silencing her from being able to speak about her religious beliefs. Strict scrutiny applies. You know, at this point, every lawyer is thinking, oh, she's going to win. And then they say, oh, but no, because the only place that you could get a website designed by Lori Smith, the owner of 303 Creative, is from Lori. And so the government has a compelling interest in forcing her to make the website that violates her religious beliefs. So that, that's up for the Supreme Court to consider. Dignity Health involves a Catholic hospital in California. They respectfully declined to do a gender transition surgery for a patient. Uh, that patient was referred to another hospital close by, got the surgery within three days. Uh, the Catholic hospital's reward for that was to be sued for sex discrimination under California law. And the California state court said that was a viable cause of action and that the ethical and religious directives for Catholic hospitals was no religious liberty defense. Uh, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Albany, uh, back in New York again. You might be noticing a trend here that a lot of these cases involve California and New York. Um, the, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Albany challenged a New York law that requires um, employers to have abortion coverage in their employer health plans. Obviously, that the church can't do that. You might be thinking, well, I thought Hobby Lobby took care of all that. Uh, well, Hobby Lobby was a RIFRA case, and RIFRA only protects against the federal government's intervention against religious liberty. It doesn't protect you against uh, New York state law. Um, so that's up there. And then finally, trustees of the New Life in Christ Church. Um, this involves tax exemptions for a pastor's house or a minister's house. And this particular church had designated a married couple as their ministers. And the Virginia courts um, got out a, a religious book and they flipped through it and they re-examined that determination, decided that under church law, these were not ministers and therefore the tax exemption didn't apply. And so the question is whether courts can intervene and decide for themselves what a church's own religious principles mean. You know, again, all of these are, should be no-brainers, but it, it, just, it just tells you what a crisis we have with state and local government officials. So what, what does this all mean? Um, well, first, it means that we've got a Supreme Court that is willing to step up and protect religious liberty. But when it does that, it's doing it in only tiny baby steps. Um, and until we have a broad ruling that overrules Employment um, Division versus Smith or, or creates some other broad protection for religious liberty litigants, um, we're going to continue to have conflicts. Um, at the same time, those conflicts are increasing um, at an amazing rate at both the federal and the state and even the local government levels, we're increasingly seeing government officials who in ways that they wouldn't have 20 or 30 years ago, intentionally taking on religion, calling religious exemptions, licenses to discriminate and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and so what does that mean for all the non-lawyers? Well, you know, number one, elections matter, and so finding uh, government officials who are willing to protect religious liberty is very important. Uh, but even more so than that, it's the, the obligation of every religious believer to explain to friends, family members, neighbors, and the public at large why protecting religious liberty is so important. Um, it, it's easy to forget that it was world religion that resulted in universities and libraries and hospitals and adoption and foster care agencies and ministers to the prisons, feeding the, the hungry, clothing the naked, um, taking care of and providing housing for the homeless. All these great works of charity are all motivated by religious belief. And if we take religion and we push it out of the, the public square so that religious adherents can practice their faith in their homes and their places of worship, then as a society, we lose this beautiful common good that humanity has enjoyed for millennia. Um, and, and it used to be a very common belief in this country. I mean, just look at RIFRA, early 1990s, 97 to 3 in the Senate, and President Clinton signed it into law, a common belief that religious liberty was worth protecting. We need to make sure that everyone understands that's still true today. So with that, I am happy to take your questions about any of these topics um, or anything about the Supreme Court generally. And I think we've got our, our first question in back. Thank you, sir. Um, Very much appreciate your presentation today. And you sort of touched on this at the end, but I'd be curious to know uh, even as it relates to vaccine mandates, how your personal faith informs your worldview, your, 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 your legal view. And then secondly, um, how, what would you say the founders would, would say to us today uh, relative to the hostility that we find uh, against uh, religion in the public square and the misapplication of Jefferson's Danbury letter uh, to the ba Danbury Baptists? Uh, 
Um, a lot of good questions wrapped up in there. Um, for me personally, my faith is very important in the work that I do. Um, it, it motivates everything that I do. I believe that uh, what I'm doing is what God is calling me to do as a professional, and that makes this professional vocation um, e extremely rewarding and um, you know, something that I treasure a great deal. Um, at the same time, I don't think that my religious beliefs uh, should, should change the law. If I think the law needs to be changed, uh, I should go and work through the democratic process and change it through my elected representatives or through ballot initiatives and, and things like that. Um, at the same time, I think that for, for far too long now, government officials and some courts have taken too dim a view of certain protections in the Constitution and principally in, in the First Amendment. And I would say that with respect not only to the Free Exercise Clause, but also with respect to the Free Speech Clause. Um, government officials and courts are allowing free speech and assembly rights to be violated today in ways that they, they never would have in the past. I mean, just to take one example, um, in the District of Columbia, uh, there were a lot of of open protests involving Black Lives Matter. And as a result of that, there were murals that were painted on streets and public buildings and, and things like that, all with the permission of the District of Columbia government. But when a pro-life group came along and wanted to create a mural, mural that said, Black pre-born lives matter, the government prohibited them from doing that. And that, that's not a religious issue. That's simply taking one side of a very contentious public debate and allowing one side to speak using public property and the other one to say no. And I could give you dozens and dozens of examples like that. Um, one of the things that we do at Alliance Defending Freedom is that we challenge speech regulations on college campuses. And, and we've won over 400 cases over the last 25 years, and yet still there continue to be numerous examples where uh, college officials are shutting down student speech. Um, one of our most memorable cases happened right down the road in Kalamazoo at the community college, where they actually prohibited students from handing out copies of the Constitution. Uh, <laughs> So um, my, my faith is very personally important to me. It should not influence the way that the law goes, but the law should respect rights that the founders intended. And that goes to your second question. What would the founders think about where our culture is today? Well, it, it's difficult to say because there was a mixed bag. Um, you know, kind of relating some of that constitutional history, we forget that even though religious liberty was a principle that our, our founders very, very much endorsed, they understood it a little bit differently than we did. They, they thought they were founding a Christian country. And sometimes that meant that not all religious liberty rights were respected. Um, it was many, many years before Catholics were allowed to serve as government officials in a number of those states that I ticked off. Um, and, and even though we look at the Supreme Court now and we say, wow, we, we've got six out of nine who are Catholic, well, prior to, to those justices making it on the court, there'd only been two Catholics in the previous 250 years, mostly as a result of, of that early discrimination. You know, at, at the same time, the, the religious discrimination that we see happening today is happening across a broad swath of sex. It's not just Christians who have certain beliefs about marriage. It's not just Christians who want to be able to live their faith publicly in the, the, the public square through the businesses that they own um, and the other activities that they engage in. And I do think that the founders would be scandalized by that. And um, you know, Jefferson is um, unintentionally part of the problem because he writes this letter and I can't remember if it's in the one you referenced or another one, that talks about the wall separating church and state. And the US Supreme Court grabs that in the early 1900s and creates a literal wall between church and state. And you can hear some people referencing that concept today when they say, well, religious people shouldn't be participating in government because we need to have a strict separation of church and state. Well, that's not at all what he was talking about. What he was talking about is what the founders meant, which is that the government should never be in the business of setting up a religion itself. That was where the wall was supposed to be. Because when the government sets up a religion, it tends to box out all the other religions, because that's where the power and the money and the prestige and the influence all come from. That's why we have an Establishment Clause. But the Establishment Clause, which is also in the First Amendment, and the Free Exercise Clause are not in conflict with each other. You can recognize on the one hand that the government should not be allowed to create its own religion and still recognize that individuals and organizations who are religious get to participate in the government. And that's the way our country has always worked. Um, so I, I think they would be scandalized. I think they would be happy about the direction that the Supreme Court is going. Um, I think they would be shocked about what government officials are, are doing right now in the, the name of challenging religious practices as discriminatory. Um, and hopefully, uh, through cultural education, we can get somewhat close back to where we started.
Could you just comment briefly on how you view Michigan law in terms of uh, religious liberty protections? Well, Michigan does not have a state RIFRA like some states do, which is unfortunate. Um, and then even when we do pass laws, like the law the legislature enacted to protect adoption and foster care agencies and preserve their religious liberty, sometimes government officials will still ignore that, you know, which is what our attorney general did. And I'm not being personally critical of her, but just as a lawyer, objectively, she settled a case that allowed that law to be voided at the expense of the very organizations that it was meant to protect. Um, we do have a, a First Amendment you know, type free exercise clause in the Michigan Constitution. Um, it, it's unclear what it means. There are some decisions that suggest that it still follows the pre-employment division versus smith Sherbert rule and other decisions that suggest it's gonna follow the, the more modern Smith jurisprudence. Um, so I would expect that sometime within the next decade or so, we're gonna get a case back in the Michigan Supreme Court where they're gonna have to resolve that once and for all. And so it'll be interesting to see what their take is on it, especially as we've seen Smith continually criticized and narrowed at, at the federal level. Um, you know, aside from that, the, the religious liberty protection in, in Michigan in the end ends up coming down a lot to the people who are charged with enforcing it. Um, if you've got uh, government officials who take a very broad view of religious liberty and, and want to use that principle in our Constitution to defend it, then we've got a pretty well-protected community. But if you've got state officials, local officials who take a very dim view of religious liberty, um, there are ways to thwart it. Um, I, I think ultimately the, the way to permanently fix it would be a constitutional amendment to have a state RIFRA. Um, but, but those aren't very popular right now because, as I mentioned, they're, they're characterized as licenses to discriminate. So that, that kind of leaves us, you know, in, in this middle place where we, we vacillate a little bit depending on who's in office. Yes. I'm getting slightly dizzy listening to you, but if I, want, if I don't want to make some sort of a, a condensation, there are a lot of people in government who think they're God or equivalent and they can do whatever they feel like. They may well be ignorant of constitutional restrictions or guidelines. And at the same time, the culture, a lot of the culture seems to be saying, I want to trust somebody. It must be those people in government are smart, the smartest people. Uh, and, and they don't essentially try and understand on their own. And you suggested that something like, um, you know, public education or, or a, a broader advocacy for understanding religious freedom would be helpful. And I'm thinking, how do you do that? Do you have any thoughts about how that might work effectively? Sure. Um, you know, just thinking about how would you start a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone about religious liberty? And, and I would actually start with Roe versus Wade, as controversial as that is. Um, in the immediate aftermath of Roe versus Wade in 1973, there was an immediate response by the federal government and many state and local governments to enshrine in statutes that medical professionals and hospitals would not have to participate in abortion if that violated their religious liberty or their conscience. Because as a society in the 1970s, we understood, we appreciated that when you don't allow religious liberty to be lived out in the public square, it's to our detriment. We would lose many hospitals, we would lose many doctors that wouldn't be able to participate in a medical system that coerced them in a way that would violate their deeply, deepest held beliefs about life. And you can see how that has shifted today. If you look at New York, um, New York is mandating that all of its public employees uh, get the vaccine, and that includes public health uh, employees. Now, whatever your, your views are on vaccinations, you know, for or against, it doesn't really matter. When it comes to forcing someone, that's gonna involve religious beliefs and an exercise of conscience. 75,000 public health employees in New York have resigned from their positions rather than get the vaccine. Is that smart of them? I, you know, I'm not gonna opine on that. But it's a catastrophe for the state of New York to lose all of those trained professionals precisely at the time when we most need them simply because the government wants to do something that's gonna override their, their personal liberty. Um, so when you start to have those conversations and then you bring it home by saying, well, you know, what if it was your beliefs and you were gonna lose your job because the government said you had to do X and you couldn't because you believed 
Why? You know, th then immediately people start to appreciate, wow, you know, th this could happen to me. I, I think many of the people in the position of forced vaccinations are confronting this issue for the very first time because they didn't have to deal with it before. And now it's kind of a widespread problem. Um, and then from there, you know, you just kind of walk it out to the, the broad societal benefits that come from having religious individuals and institutions engaged in our culture and all the great things that they do for us. Um, I, I think that's a, a great place to start, if that's helpful. Could you clarify something for me? Um, the Wall Street Journal editorial page covered this. It was one of the few that did. But pertaining to the New York City case of the Catholic Diocese, was that the case also? I believe there were some Hasidic Jewish organizations that were involved with that also. Correct. And that was the case that was rendered shortly after King Amy Coney Barrett got on the court, and it was a 5-4. Yes. Which shook me up really badly. And I, the fact that a supposedly conservative judge uh, voted against that. Yeah. And if my understanding is correct, if Coney Barrett did not get on, it would have been 4-4, four, four, and that then the law of the land, correct me if I'm wrong, would have been that someone like Como, our governor here, would then have the explicit ability to limit in perpetuity the amount of people that could go to a Christian or a Jewish service yes, simply based on an emergency that they proclaimed be, be, because themselves. Because for, for a short time, that was the rule. Um, the, the, the case that preceded the archdiocese case in New York came out of California, and it was a Governor Newsom regulation that was um, prohibiting churches from having more than um, 50 congregants or 25% of their capacity. But yet, entertainment venues um, and you know, large big box stores and things like that could have many more people than that so long as they used the masks and had social distancing. And that was challenged all the way to the US Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided not to intervene, which is, is different than not taking the case. You know, it, it went up on an emergency injunction request. And they said, well, we're not gonna give you an injunction. And the vote was five to four. That was when Ginsburg was still alive. And all four of the conservative, you know, conservative we say because they were nominated by Republican presidents, um, voted in favor of the rights of the churches, the religious liberty rights, but they were outvoted. And Chief Justice Roberts was the fifth vote. Um, what he explained in that case is that when it comes to pandemics, courts should defer to public health officials. And if public health officials think that it's more dangerous to have people congregate in a church than in an entertainment venue or a big box store, who are we to second guess them? So then when the Archdiocese of New York case comes along, um, Roberts did not write, but he voted the same way as he did in the California case. And the difference was Justice Barrett replacing Justice Ginsburg. And it was you know, from that moment then that we had a cascade of decisions in the lower courts all following this new precedent, which respected the religious liberty rights of churches to gather under COVID regulations. Um, so that, that was a hugely pivotal moment in this religious liberty uh, timeline. Yes, or, or until New York decided to repeal it, right? I think I saw a hand here in the front row. So I'm curious, um, the main objection when they say that the a RIFRA provision is a license to discriminate is because they argue that, well, if we made religious exemptions uh, for any basis, then a vacation rental could say, I'm not going to, um, rent to a, a black person because I find them to be unworthy somehow. And the seems to me the task is to try to explain why and I'm not and I'm I've trying to come up with an intellectually honest with integrity way to distinguish between the cake making for a gay wedding when the US Supreme Court has said that that conduct can be engaged in constitutionally uh, versus the re the race issues and so on. I'm just curious what you have, what your thoughts are about how to clarify that it's not being used as a license to discriminate when that's sort of the fear in the background that's at least being articulated as why it would be a concern to have those amendments. Yes, that, that, that's a, a very difficult question to answer. Um, and, and it kind of comes in two varieties. Um, you know, thinking about 
some of the conflicts that we see between um, those who advocate for same-sex marriage and religion. Um, the very first argument that you hear out of the other side is even less nuanced than that. It's a straw man. Well, if you uphold religious exemptions, then gay people won't be able to go to the hospital and get medical care, and they won't be able to go to the restaurant. Um, well, well, first, that's not happening. Religious people don't exclude someone because of, of their status. All the cases that we're talking about are individuals whose exercise of their religion is being impacted in a particular way. Um, and if someone is refused access to the hospital because of their sexual orientation, that should be a violation of the law. We, we should all be able to agree that status discrimination is wrong. But message discrimination, participation discrimination, is completely different. So you know, take Jack Phillips, he's a perfect example of this. He would have sold any pre-made, off-the-shelf cookies, brownies, cakes that any same-sex couple wanted it. Once he's created it, they can take it and they can do what they want with it. They can even celebrate a wedding. The only thing he was objecting to was being asked to create a custom cake that celebrated something that he disagreed with. So we're not talking about a, you know, a, a broad principle that says, you don't get to buy a cake from Jack Phillips. You know, it's, it's the very narrow situation where someone's religious rights come in conflict with someone's request for a message or participation. Now, as for the race question, the Supreme Court has already answered that for us. Uh, the Supreme Court has said repeatedly that racial discrimination doesn't have any logical underpinning in any religion or any other line of thought, that it's odious in every single one of its iterations. In contrast, in Obergefell, which created the right to same-sex marriage, again in Masterpiece Cake Shop, and then to um, an extent, even in this recent Fulton decision involving Philadelphia and the foster care agency, it says that people who have beliefs about marriage being between a man and a woman do so based on very honorable principles that have been believed by billions of people for thousands of years and that it's not discrimination to hold that marriage belief in the way that it is to be discriminatory when you say, I won't serve you because of your race. So the, the Supreme Court has already answered that question. Government officials are a little slow to pick up on it. Um, you know, th those, I think, are, are technical answers um, and, and may not satisfy someone. So I would go one further and, and say, you know, personally, and, and you'd have to speak for yourselves, you know, but as a, a Christian, um, it's certainly my responsibility to treat everyone with love, dignity, and respect because everyone is made in the image and likeness of God. And I would never treat anyone with anything less than the utmost respect and dignity because of who they are. Even then, there are certain things that I cannot do. You know, say I was a judge. I would not be able to officiate at a, a same-sex wedding because of my deeply held religious beliefs. I would still treat those people with respect. Um, you know, my... my even have them over for dinner. But there's a difference between treating someone with respect and forcing me to violate my religious beliefs. Um, because so many of these religious conflicts come in this, this area, you know, it's interesting to note that when the advocates for same-sex marriage being constitutionalized, and which is a whole separate lecture that we could have, whether that's constitutional or not, um, the, the argument was, this won't affect anybody else. It only affects the two people who want to get married. And that quickly pivoted as soon as that decision was rendered into, now this affects everybody. Because not only do you have to recognize my marriage, but you have to participate it, and you have to celebrate it. And if you don't do that, then you're a hateful person, you're a discriminator, and you can be fined, you can lose your business, and you can go to jail. That, that's an incredible journey in, in just six years. And that does not reflect the kind of respect and dignity for every individual person that religion encourages and, and, and really instructs, or that as a society we believe in. So I, I hope those are some helpful thoughts. We have time for one more question. Hi, right, quickly, uh, what's the current status for employees that want to um, sort of refuse um, em employer-mandated training, things like uh, Title IX training and gender training, things like that, in the workplace? Um, that, that's a touchy issue for uh, a couple of reasons. First, when you're talking about your rights vis-a-vis -vis your employer, the Constitution doesn't apply. 
You know, sometimes people will look at a situation like that where an employer compels an employee to wear a pin or attend a training, you know, whatever, and they'll say, well, they're violating my free speech rights. Well, you don't have any free speech rights vis-a-vis -vis your employer. You don't have any free exercise rights either. Um, what you do have under federal and state laws is uh, protection against religious discrimination. So if you could demonstrate that the training was violating your religious beliefs in some way, just like if they required you to work on your Sabbath if that wasn't necessary, um, you would be able to assert an employment claim on that basis. Um, but you, you have much more limited rights than you do when you have a public employer and the full extent of the Constitution and specifically the First Amendment are, are in play. All right, um, I'm gonna be hanging around for a little bit after we're concluded here. If you have other questions, I'm happy to answer those. But thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for that wonderful talk and Q&A, John. We very much appreciate it. Uh, thank you all also for coming today. Just a couple of brief announcements. Uh, just a friendly reminder that we do uh, like your feedback, so please return your